I was always lucky enough to live not far from the sea when I was young. I like to swim under the surface more than on the surface. I like to see what was underneath. I've always had that interest in what happened in the sea. I love it when it's really peaceful, with just the sound of the sea, and you can hear the animals breathing. Throughout his childhood, Richard Sears traveled between America and Europe, mostly by boat. Over time, his interest in the sea grew. But it wasn't until he became an adult that he discovered a real passion for whales. The spark came when I was around 18. I was at university. I went to a training ship to learn how to sail. But there were biologists aboard who taught us oceanography. And for two and a half months, that's what I did. Sail on a schooner, and that's when the idea of becoming a field biologist began to germinate. During that voyage, Richard Sears had his first real encounters with whales. His studies then took on new meaning. He increasingly felt the call of the open sea. At Matamec in 1976, I'd seen my first blue whales in Moisey Bay, and I was stunned at their size. Even next to a fin whale, they were enormous. The blowhole impressed me. The, the hole was so big it felt you could almost jump in. His fascination for blue whales took him above the 50th parallel to the Mangal Archipelago, a place known for its granite islands with spectacular rocks, its intriguing birds, and the presence of blue whales. In 1979, Richard Sears came to the village of Long Pointe de Mangal with his inflatable boat and his tent. There he met the Paquet family, who offered him their hospitality. In addition to being the beginning of a beautiful friendship, this meeting marked the birth of the Mangal Islands Research Station. Even though the fishermen knew the whales, nobody talked about them. It wasn't important. We were brought up with them, so seeing them was natural for us. Then Richard came with all the people he brought here, and it grew in importance. For more than 30 years, Richard studied not only the blue whales in the estuary and the Gulf of St. Lawrence, but he'd go to places like Iceland and the Gulf of California to observe other blue whale populations. All the information he accumulated on blue whales was compiled at the Mangal Island Cetacean Study Research Station. Richard is the founder, the visionary. It was he who was capable of building the station with very few resources, the one with who determination and intensity made us push harder. Christian is very precise. He's our scientist. He provides facts and statistics. And it's often he who sheds light on specific questions. There's one project at the moment where, in collaboration with the Department of Fishery and Oceans, where we look at um, why the blue whales here vanished. Because Richard built a station here because blue whales were very abundant until like the beginning of the 90s. And ironically, actually, when that building here was finished, the blue whales vanished. There are two males who were in that group in the beginning that we still see. No, three males. Apart from them, we don't see any of the animals who were regulars here. Yeah. 
while Frédéric and Christian continue their observations at sea in the Mangal sector and pursue their analysis at the research center, Richard has no choice but to go to the other side of the St. Lawrence River to the tip of the Gaspé Peninsula if he wants to observe the blue whales. We got a call from Gaspé saying there was plenty of blow spotted off Cape Gaspé and Cape Bonami. More than 10, nearer 20, so it's worth our while going up there. More than a dozen hours after leaving the Mango Islands on the North Shore, he finally arrives at his final destination, Forion Park in the Gaspé. Richard is hoping the blue whales reported some days ago are still around. Go on, that's it, carry on like that. After a restful night that made him forget the long journey from Mengon to the Gaspé Peninsula, Richard Sears finally puts his boat into the water for a spin at sea, despite the wind which seems to be picking up. That feels good. I feel good on the water. That doesn't mean I don't feel good in other places. I can feel great in a blues bar listening to some good music. The situation isn't bad. As long as this northeast wind doesn't get any stronger. We have a few blows here of Forillon. Just where the cruise passengers indicated. And we'll hope that there are a few blues in there so that we can see them and perhaps work on them. There are another two blows down there not far off. For several years now, Richard has been interested in the social interaction between the blue whales. That's why he tries to spot them when they surface in a group of two or three. Richard's strong point is that he's naturally gifted with animals and at interpreting what's going on. Slow, slow right down. I've got them. No need to go any faster. He's there. Ah, it's okay. He's acting like a male. It's incredible. We only see these animals for a maximum of 5% of their life. We try to get to know the idiosyncrasies and peculiarities of each individual in a population we're studying. We have to learn to look as much as possible, and that takes time. We can see where he came out. It's just here. So the last frames were of the one approaching, there. In observation terms, we can recognize individuals, we can recognize what they're doing, and sometimes it's just the way they come back to the surface to breathe. Different individuals will do it differently. There's some rumble breath. You see the female do what we call rumble breath. We know females use this a lot when the males approach. It's because they don't really want the male around. On each trip out to sea, Richard photographs the whales so he can identify them. I got the other side of that one. Who's that behind? Through his talents as an observer, he quickly spots new individuals. But to find out more about the animal's sex, a biopsy is required. And that's not always easy to perform. Okay, he's turning and coming up to dive. Shit! 
Nothing. Well played, David. Forward, David. Cross to that one. When I'm at sea, I'm pretty focused on what I'm doing. I want to be sure that things are done right and we get things done, because I know personally that if I'm not really into what I'm doing, I won't work as well as I can and I'll miss things. He's ahead of us. That's good. Turn towards him. The arrow broke again. Two on the same animal. Have you ever seen that? Quick, keep pointing. It's intense. You learn a lot in the field with Richard, but you've got to keep up with him. You wanted action, you get action. I think if I had to describe you, the word I'd use is rock and roll. If you already have, one of my best friends calls me rock and roll. Okay, it's good. Slow, slow. We got it. All right. We got a good sample anyway. It cost us two arrows. We might have an hour left. What time is it? Five o'clock? Maybe just over an hour of light. That's good. Not a bad day. No, not bad, not bad. The thousands of photos taken by Richard and his team are compiled in the Mangal Island Cetacean Study Database. From this, the team can trace the movements of each individual, whether spotted in the Mangal sector or the waters closer to the Gaspé Peninsula. Of the individuals who are well known around the Gaspé, there's Opera, who has big marks, big scars. Sight, who has small ones. Those are things that don't change. You can use them for photo identification. Here you have some broad marks on trauma, on the flank, marks that might have been made by a boat propeller. That's often the case. If we take certain individuals, we'll see that sometimes they're observed around the Gaspé Peninsula, all along the north shore to Matan, the Méchins, in the estuary, at Sept-Îles. Some individuals cover all of these zones, and we observe movements, sometimes in the space of a few days, between the various zones. Even though Richard and his team can monitor the movement of the blue whales circulating in the St. Lawrence estuary, there's still a mystery surrounding those who frequented the Mangal sector up until the early 1990s. So and that coincides with the same years when the cod stocks collapsed. And then we said, what effect did that have? For instance, in, the, in those years, then um, more finbacks and more humpbacks arrived. So we are trying to look at um, the entire picture of the St. Lawrence ecosystem. These events forced Richard and his colleagues to study the question from various angles. What can the link be between the fall off in cod stocks and the disappearance of blue whales in the Mangal sector? Did you see the blows this morning? We didn't go out. Just by looking in the bay here, we can see white caps in the middle. So I'd rather go from the other side of the peninsula and do a bit of what we call spotting to see what's happening. And if it calms down, we'll try to go out. The days spent watching the horizon provide a time for reflection and sometimes shed new light on certain issues. 
by seeking any links that might exist between the fall in cod stocks and the virtual disappearance of blue whales in the Mangal sector, Richard and his colleagues came to the conclusion that this phenomenon could be triggered by an imbalance in the food chain. The cod is a big, big fish. Big fish eat little fish. And the little fish eat krill. The less big cod, the more little fish, because their main predator is gone. And they can eat krill and perhaps provide competition. The blue whale is a specialist. He'll just feed on krill. When there are thousands of tons of these fish, the blue whale won't even come by and try to compete with that. The fact is, they've left this feeding area where they used to go to concentrate on the estuary and along the Gaspé Peninsula. Is the same thing happening in the estuary? Well, for a few years now, numbers have been dropping. So, is this something that will spread across the St. Lawrence? In order to find out more about the activity of blue whales in the last few days, Richard has been visiting cruise boat operators who have reported the presence of marine mammals in the sector. In the past week, there were blues on two days, three blues together. That's pretty rare. That does interest me, because what's happening is the third is another male trying to edge out. Or was it quite relaxed or did it happen quickly? Uh, easy. They came out together. Sometimes they come out of the water and race like horses in a field. What's happening underneath is that the male, there's a pair like that, the other comes in, he tries to ease the first one out. Humpbacks do this in the Caribbean and it's much more obvious. The blues are more discreet, it's not often spotted. Richard is looking forward to seeing this new phenomenon, which he calls a rumba. He's hoping for the wind to drop so he can put out to sea. Let's go. It looks good, but there are a few waves in the bay. I think we can try a quick sortie. If there's too much wind, we'll come back. Richard is aware that in early autumn, his chances of seeing a trio of blue whales dancing a rumba are slim, as this phenomenon usually happens later in the season, during the reproduction period. If we had a chance to observe the interaction between blue whales in pairs and trios later in the autumn, we'd be getting closer to reproduction. It's a little like being in a bar until 10, 11 o'clock, 12, midnight, but leaving before closing time, that's when the interesting things happen. So closing time would be November, December, January. Turn! Turn us around! We saw these two leave the water in a race. We saw a good quarter, maybe a third of the body leave the water. We didn't get a clear sight. It was very short, a quick image of a few seconds. That's all we could see. We didn't see the hope for rumba, but it might have happened. We're going home now. His expedition over, Richard is leaving the Gaspé Peninsula and heading for Mangon, where he'll join the other members of the team and analyze the information gathered on the new individuals observed. Richard is worried about the blue whale's future. 
Because aside from the disappearance of cod stocks, this whale is also threatened by heavy maritime traffic in the St. Lawrence, by toxic chemicals still present in the river, and by the acoustic pollution due to gas and oil exploration, among others. There might not be one big threat. If you add all the little problems up for already small, endangered population, that could be just too much to recover. And that might be one reason why we don't really see any really improvement in the, in the numbers here. I have no illusions that we're going to save the whales or something like that. That's the goal at the end of the line, to not necessarily save them, but to keep what we have and ensure that the ecosystem in which they live, for them and for other organisms, should be as healthy as it can be. We'll get there bit by bit, by adding knowledge, as it's through knowledge that we'll gain a better understanding of what happens in each ecosystem. I think that's how we can contribute. And after that, it'll be up to whoever manages the resources to use this knowledge properly and judiciously manage the whale stocks as well as the ecosystems in which they live. Richard Sears has come a long way since 1979, the year he moved to Mengon. Oh, Richard, so glad to see you. You look well. Yes, I'm fine. For more than 30 years, he has contributed enormously to raising awareness of blue whales in the Atlantic. On the 30th anniversary, I asked Richard for the first time. I wanted the station to bear the name of Richard Sears. <laughs> Wait till I'm floating in the waves and not breathing. I'll be floating before you. Uh, you don't know that. 